Yes, thank you for the introduction, Puya. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, this is a joint work with Agelos Kiyas and Von Haulio. Uh, this is the outline of the talk. So first, I will introduce the primitive, and I will present the adversarial model, and I will give some motivation behind the model. Then I will present results and construction, and finally, if there is still time, I will give some intuition. Uh, so some very basic stuff. So any encoding scheme, like a pair, like of an, uh, is, is an encoding uh, procedure, has the encoding procedure and the decoding procedure, and the minimum requirement is correctness. So we want, like, for any message S, the decoding of the encoding of S should be equal to S. So an example of an encoding scheme is an error correction code. Uh, which guarantees correctness if there is a bounded number of errors over the code word. Non-malleable codes were introduced by Zibowski, Pieterzak, and Wicks in 2010. This year we also have like a uh, other journal version of their paper. Uh, and informally, uh, non-malleability means that you cannot create like correlated code words, meaning that you cannot tamper with a code word in a way that decodes to a message which is related to the original one. Of course, if it is different, right? Uh, so uh, the tampering experiment that we consider is the following. So we have the adversary. We have a message uh, which is denoted by S. Uh, first, we encode our message, and we get a code word C. And then the adversary applies a tampering function F on the code word. And we have a code word C prime, and then decoding uh, uh, takes place. So the output of the decoder can be either like the original message or it can be a special symbol, a symbol bottom which uh, basically tells us that C prime is an invalid code word uh, or uh, it can be like a message S prime which we say that S prime like should be unrelated to S. And uh, more formally, uh, this is like the, the execution that was considered in the previous slide. Uh, it's what we call the real world execution in which the adversary interacts with, uh, with the code word over the message S, the private message S. And then non-malleability means that for any such adversary we have a simulator. Uh, the simulator uh, uh, interacts uh, with the adversary uh, without having access to S and he's able to produce a view uh, which is indistinguishable from the real view, from the real execution. And uh, of course, the adversary cannot distinguish between the two worlds, right? And since the simulator does not have access to S, uh, uh, this gives like privacy uh, over the message. Um, so the main application of non malleable codes that was like proposed in the original paper is like for. Uh, for having like, uh, for achieving tamper resilience uh, against uh, physical attacks. Uh, so let's say you have any cryptographic uh, hardware, it can be a smart card that computes like some functionality G over private state S. So it could compute, let's say, digital signatures uh, over like uh, signing key S. Uh, so the standard adversary, the, the black box adversary, He's like querying the, the, the hardware, the, device, the functionality with input X and receives the output of the computation. Um, uh, this is the black box adversary, but of course in reality the adversary can be much more powerful because he can exploit uh, physical properties of the implementation and he can mount like uh, attacks that we call physical attacks. Uh, so the community has like put significant effort like in in modeling such attacks. So one way to model them is like uh, considering attacks against the memory of, of the cryptographic hardware. So uh, in this setting, the adversary uh, gives input X to the, to, the, to the functionality, and he can also uh, issue like a tampering query F, and he receives the output of the computation uh, G uh, over X, but evaluated over the tampered memory value, which is F of S. And the main goal is like to, uh, to infer information over the private state or like to compute stuff that uh, he wouldn't be allowed to compute without tampering. Uh, so non-malleable codes provide a straightforward way to, to protect against such attacks. And the, qu the solution is very like simple. Basically what we do is like if this is the original functionality with private state S, what we do is like we encode uh, our private state using a non-malleable encoding scheme. 
And the compiled functionality G hat first needs to recover the original message. Uh, so it first decodes S hat and recovers S and computes the original functionality over S and X. Uh, of course, this requires uh, that uh, the, computational is trust the computation is trusted, uh, but this is like different line of work, like modeling attacks against the computation is not considered like in this, in this work. So any attack against the memory here, like any application of a function F here, can be simulated without having access to the original uh, private state. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot achieve like security against any, uh, uh, any tampering function class. For instance, consider uh, the function that first decodes. The code word like, applies any function like, uh, to, to the message, like plus one, and then re-encodes. Then the resulting code word is highly related, right? So we cannot achieve security against any class that contains F. Uh, so over the last years, there have been many, many papers that consider different models. Uh, apologies if, like, you have a paper and it's not citing in, in this slide. Uh, uh, so we have, like, split-state functions. We have uh, permutation, bitwise tampering, and, and uh, many others. Uh, so in this work, we consider uh, partial functions. Um, so uh, the idea is that uh, we allow the adversary to, uh, to access arbitrary, uh, subset of, uh, arbitrary subsets of code code locations with specific cardinality. So before, uh, like in split state functions, let's say, you put like some structural restriction on the way the adversary is accessing the private memory, but he can access the entire private memory. So he can overwrite, let's say, the code word, uh, uh, but there is a restriction, for instance, in split state, uh, the attacker who tampers with the left part of the memory, he doesn't have access on the right part of the memory and symmetrically for the other part. Uh, so here there is no structural restriction and the adversary is allowed to choose code word locations. So as in any coding scheme, we want efficiency, where efficiency like is measured by uh, the information rate of the encoding scheme, uh, which is actually uh, the message length over the code word length as, a, as the message length goes to infinity. And we also, in this paper, consider another measure of effectiveness that we call access rate, uh, which actually uh, reflects the adversarial access. So it is actually the, uh, uh, the, the number of code word symbols or bits that the adversary is allowed to access over the total number of code word bits of, or symbols. Um, and again, we take the limit. So ideally, we would like rate one for both of them. So the main question that we try like, to answer in this paper is like if we can have like efficient non-malleable codes, meaning high information rate, uh, that uh, while allowing the adversary to access almost the entire code word, which means high, high access rate. So I will give some motivation behind the model first, right? Because the attack that I described uh, like uh, some slides uh, before, like does not apply in this setting, right? Uh, fully uh, like decoding and then re-encoding does not apply anymore. So this trivial attack that I described does not apply. However, the fact that we allow the adversary to pick the locations carefully, uh, uh, it allows for like potential attacks, right? So if let's say you use a primitive to, to uh, like encryption to, to build non-malleable codes, then the adversary, if, if he carefully chooses the locations, he can choose like a secret key and uh, like uh, something else and ciphertext. So if you use hash, he can choose like to alter the hash and the pre-image. Uh, so, uh, so he might be able somehow to create correlated code words or to break security. Uh, secondly, uh, partial functions is a model that complies with real world attacks, like with attacks that we have seen that can recover uh, the private state of the primitive uh, by doing like only uh, small modifications over the, the private state of the primitive. Uh, uh, the third point is that the passive analog uh, of, of this model, uh, uh, when the adversary is not uh, uh, modifying uh, code word location, but he's only reading code, code word locations, uh, implies all or nothing transforms, which is a primitive that was introduced by reverse in 97, 1997 and has numerous applications. So all or nothing transforms say is like uh, the adversary is similar, but uh, he only receives uh, 
uh, read access over the code word, and what you require is privacy. So non-malleable codes for partial functions imply all or nothing transforms. And finally, uh, constant functions are excluded from the model, so potentially uh, we can achieve stronger primitives. So actually, this is what we do. We achieve a stronger notion, which we call uh, non-malleable codes uh, with manipulation detection, uh, which manipulation detection is on top of uh, non-malleability. So we have simulation-based security, and we also achieve manipulation detection. So manipulation detection guarantees that uh, the modified code word will either decode to uh, the original message or it will decode to uh, uh, the invalid uh, symbol uh, bottom. Uh, so, uh, as I said, manipulation detection does not apply non-malleable codes ma with manipulation detection, but the, the, the other way around holds. And I, I would like to stress out that this is an important property for the applications of the primitive, right? So if you have manipulation detection, you can use the primitive like in other like settings than Tampa resilience, like for secure communication, right? We cannot allow the adversary to override the whole message. We need to know, the, the, the receiver needs to know that he received actually uh, the correct message or he wants to detect that somebody tampered with the, with the communication. Uh, so assuming one-way functions, we construct this notion, um, uh, non-malleable codes with manipulation detection in the CRS model uh, with rate one and deformation rate one minus over omega log k, where k is the security parameter. Uh, we are in the computational setting. And then we show how to remove the CRS. Uh, and uh, we have a construction in the standard model uh, with uh, information rate and access rate one over uh, one minus over omega log k. And we increase the alphabet size. So before the adversary was accessing bits of the code word, now he's accessing like bit strings of length log k. We have like, al uh, our symbols are like, uh, the alphabet is bigger. Uh, and our results of course apply efficient all or nothing transforms. Uh, under standard assumptions, and which is, like to our knowledge, is the first construction that achieves this, this kind of rate uh, under standard assumptions. So uh, I will go over the challenges a bit and uh, towards the construction. So we cannot allow the adversary to read the entire like code word. Otherwise, we have the trivial attack, and of course, this might not be a partial function, but I would like to say it anyway. Um, secondly, we have an impossibility result on the information theoretic setting by Jiraji Nguzwami, which says that any scheme that achieves a constant access and information rate, it can only achieve security with constant probability. So we focus on the information theoretic setting. And since we need privacy, let's start like to build our construction from a, a an, an encrypt, an encrypt, let's have an encryption based solution. Uh, so what we do is like, uh, sorry. So uh, what we do is that we encrypt our message, we use symmetric encryption, and we encrypt our message using a secret key. And then we somehow distribute like uh, the ciphertext and the secret key inside the code word in any possible way, like we don't care. We put somehow those bits inside the code word and we don't care about the structure. And we might also use some other like primitives to achieve security. So this, those patterned bits over here denote, let's say, I don't know, a commitment or zero knowledge proof or something that we use to achieve security. Um, so uh, any, any such type of attack like can have, uh, of, of construction can have a, a simple attack. What is the attack? The attacker simply, he's accessing the secret key. The secret key is short. We are in the computational setting. Right? So compared to the message length, the secret key length is very small. So the attacker is accessing the secret key and constant number of uh, bits of uh, the ciphertext, and he can partially recover the message. And he requires access rate of like this, uh, uh, of like uh, length of SK over, over the message length, which is very small, right? Um, so we might actually try uh, to, uh, to protect the secret key, like using some inner encoding. So instead of storing the, uh, the secret key directly to, to the code word, we like store uh, the encoding over the secret key. But again, we have, we have the same problem because any such encoding will be short. Uh, it will be very efficient and its length is gonna be independent of the length of the message. So we can have the same attack again. Uh, one other solution would be like to encode the, the, uh, the ciphertext. 
somehow so that partial uh, uh, decryption cannot happen anymore. However, this encoding over here, uh, its length is proportional to, to the message. So the length uh, is gonna, this, this will affect the length of the scheme. And we would like to achieve like uh, the best possible rate. Uh, so uh, the question is, is it possible to have like access rate greater than this fraction? Uh, and more generally, uh, is it possible to have access rate uh, which is greater than the weakest primitive that you use in your construction sustains? You have a secret key of specific length. Can you read more than this specific length? Um, so the observation here is that the structure of the code word is fixed. And the attacker knows all the sensitive code word locations. He knows the locations of the secret key, for instance. So the main idea is like to hide the structure via randomization, right? We somehow uh, 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 kill the structure. And uh, of course, it is easy to kill the structure, but you need a way to recover the structure, right? You need some information that will uh, enable you to decode. Because if, if the adversary like uh, uh, modifies things, if like say permute things, you don't know uh, where are like the secret key bits? Where is the ciphertext? You know nothing. So, uh, so in this work, like we implement uh, this structure recovering mechanism in two ways. Our first construction is in the CRS model, and then we saw how to remove the CRS. So what we do actually is uh, we encrypt uh, our messages using symmetric authenticated using authenticated encryption. And we also apply a, a protection, like an inner encoding, to protect the secret key. Our protection over the secret key is very efficient and very simple. Uh, what we actually do is like we secret share the secret key and secret key to the third. So the value three, like you can consider also other values there. It, we just need a nonlinear relation over the secret key. So we construct this encoding and we get Z. And then we randomly distribute the bits of Z in, inside the code word uh, according to the CRS. So the CRS defines the code word locations in which we are going to store uh, the sensitive bits, like the bits uh, output by the inner encoding. Uh, and the remaining, uh, the remaining bits, like the white bits, store, uh, store the ciphertext. Of course, there, there is an important detail here. Uh, the tampering function is not adaptive with respect to the CRS. So first, the adversary fixes the locations of the code word that he's going to access. Then we sample the CRS. And then the adversary tampers with the code word while receiving read access over the CRS, which is a restriction that we'll, we'll remove later. Uh, so the idea has as follows behind like, the proof. Uh, due to the shuffling, since we permute like, uh, uh, the locations, uh, we can prove that the adversary le learns nothing about SK and SK to the third. He only, he's only accessing shares for those values, but he learns nothing about the secret key. So let's say that he modifies z in a way such that this pair through the function f goes to this pair, sk prime and sk double prime. So the idea is that uh, having, uh, having that the adversary learns nothing about the secret key, if he modifies those values in a way that actually uh, he, he produces like a, a different key, different SK or different SK to the third, then we can prove that uh, uh, the probability uh, uh, in, uh, according to which the new value satisfy this relation, SK, SK to the third, is negligible. Otherwise, we have a way to recover the original secret key. And we break security of encryption. Uh, and now simulation is like straightforward. Uh, why? The adversary is only accessing shares. So we can give shares to the adversary and we can check if he modifies the secret key or not. If he modifies the secret key, the simulator outputs bottom. Otherwise, the secret key is secure and security follows um, 
by the authenticity property of the encryption scheme, which means that if he modifies the ciphertext, uh, the simulator outputs bottom, otherwise we know that the code word like is like the same, the message is secure. Uh, so of course the restriction over the CRS, we want to avoid it. Uh, so uh, in our next construction, we managed to remove the CRS, and how we are doing it, uh, we, increase, we increase the alphabet size. So before, like those boxes were bits. Now those boxes are blocks or symbols of size log k, where k is the security parameter. So again, we have, uh, we encrypt, uh, and we use the inner encoding, and uh, we have uh, sensitive and non-sensitive blocks. The white blocks are like uh, ciphertext blocks, which we call like non-sensitive, and the blue or gray, it should be gray, but now it's blue, uh, the, the blue, let's say, blocks are like um, sensitive blocks in which we use to store Z, uh, the sensitive bits. So uh, the structure has as follows. It's like non-sensitive uh, block starts with a zero and stores like part of the ciphertext. It's sensitive like a block starts with a bit one and stores uh, the index of uh, the bit together with the bit. So an example for such a block would be like one, uh, five, and the fifth bit of Z. Um, and we can prove security using similar arguments as before. Uh, so to conclude, uh, we propose a stronger notion, which is like non codes with manipulation detection, uh, which we believe it might like uh, 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 gives us like applications of the primitive beyond tamper resilience, like for secure communication or like uh, anything, uh, like any application in which you require uh, some sort of like uh, uh, detection if like the attacker has modified the original message or not. Uh, we, we have efficient constructions uh, for this notion for the class of partial functions uh, constructions that are like, uh, they can be all uh, like implemented. And uh, we also propose several applications like in Tampa Resilient Cryptography for Boolean and arithmetic circuits and um, for secure communication over adversarial channels and uh, of course the application like uh, uh, that comes, all the applications that are like come from uh, all or nothing transforms. Uh, uh, thank you for listening. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. The paper is on e-print. <laughs>